Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Rock this morning. I like hearing the laughter. That's good. Yeah. Glad to have you all here. Uh, what turned out to be a beautiful day last night, we were kind of like, if you looked outside and there was snow. I was like, you're kidding me. But uh, it's melting, so we're glad to be here. Let's begin with a word from Psalm chapter 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Let's pray. Father God, you are our shield. You are our glory. You are the ones who lifts our heads when we don't feel like lifting. And Father God, we cry aloud to you. And we pray that you would answer us today. That you are great, you are mighty, you are powerful, and it is a a privilege and honor to gather and to lift your name high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. This morning our praise hymn is All Glory, Lord, and Honor, page 126 in the red hymnal. We'll sing all three verses. Please stand. that we are sinners, we do not deserve glory or law or any honor, and so we come before you thanking you for Jesus, thanking you for the cross, and lifting your name high. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hey, welcome to Cedar Rock this morning on this Paul Sunday. We're glad you're here with us. A couple of announcements as we begin our time together. First off, next Sunday is Easter, and so we look forward to celebrating Easter uh, with our annual Easter sunrise service at 7 a.m. right here in this room. The choir is going to lead us in uh, the cantata and in worship, uh, to, to worship him and music. We look forward to that time. I hope you'll be able to join us next Sunday at 7 a.m. And uh, right after our sunrise service at 7, the men will be cooking a delicious breakfast for us. And, and so we want to come and, and fellowship together with breakfast after that and have uh, Sunday school right after that. So we hope you'll be here with us next Sunday to celebrate our risen King. Speaking of Easter, we've got our Annie Armstrong offering going on right now. But all the money that goes towards that goes towards North American church planters, people starting churches in, in very hard to, to, to difficult areas, places where there's not a lot of Christians. And right now we're at $578. Our goal is $900. So mm. consider how you can prayerfully give towards that. 
As we move to our time of prayer, a couple things. First, we want to praise God for. Uh, yesterday, we had our Easter egg extravaganza here at the church. And uh, it was, um, in my mind, resounding <laughs> success, resounding praise. We counted, had over 80 people on campus here yesterday. Um, and so, if you helped or served in any capacity yesterday, would you stand real quick so we can thank you? Would y'all thank these Spencer stand too. <laughs> don't just happen. They require a lot of time and effort and people volunteering time and effort and, and yeah. cooking hot dogs and making decorations and preparing things. And so uh, it, was a, it was a great time. We, everybody who came heard the gospel yesterday. They, all, we all gathered in here and we had a giveaway and, and they heard the gospel and then the kids went out and found eggs at record time. I'm going to tell you, you, you think you have a lot of eggs and then you get that many kids out there and boom, they're gone. And they, they just got them up. So praise God for that. Uh, continue to, to pray for our children's ministries that we have here at the church and, and for those workers. And if you feel called or led to help us in those things, let us know. We will find a place for you to serve. Um, also, related to that, a prayer request tomorrow. Uh, Cedar Rock will be helping with Good News Club tomorrow, so uh, we want to pr uh, pray for us in that. And, and, and uh, if you are helping, I guess we can Yes. Yeah, I think you and I had talked about maybe meeting after church, but I really let me have a show of hands if you don't mind if who will be there tomorrow. Yes, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, because you, you know what you're responsible and you got yours, and I'll do pretty much what I did the last time. I'll hand you out your sheets or whatever when we get there, and hopefully we'll have it all covered tomorrow. So I don't really think we need to meet tomorrow. I mean today after okay. church. Okay. Glenda, um, organizational mastermind. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we went to the last good music club and she had like structured sheets and timeline. And I was like, this is amazing. So thank you for that. So pray for us as we serve those kids tomorrow uh, as well. Uh, also, when a, Susan Sutton asked us to pray for her aunt, Margaret Smith, who's, who fell and broke her hip. We want to pray for her. And one of the Susan's clients who has cancer, I think she said the sixth time, is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's having surgery this week. We want to pray for that person. Also, continue to pray for Ms. Kat Nelms, the Donnie Aycock family, uh, Nancy Vester, Violet Spencer, Mary Helen Gupton, Carlton Sturdivant, Margaret Gupton, Thomas Ambrith, Danny Lewis, Teresa Spruill, um, Robert Carol Boone, and Meredith Bird, who is serving in Uganda. Any other names you want to lift up or praises we're going to mention today? I shared with Katie yesterday um, a friend of ours that had rebecca cancer, well, she's had real bad preeclampsia and her blood pressure went high. She was only 26 weeks pregnant and they transferred her to Chapel Hill. They took the baby by C-section yesterday afternoon and the baby is breathing on its own at one pound, four ounces. Amen. So please keep the prayers coming. Pray for this little baby that was born really early, one pound, four ounces. Pray for her, pray for the mother. And, uh, for the son. Little boy. Okay. Let's let these praise and requests up to the Father this morning. God, we thank you that we can come together as your church, as your people, God. We can intercede on behalf of those in our church and our community who are suffering. God, we pray that you would be with those that we've, we've mentioned, those who are suffering from cancer, or suffering from illness, or maybe uh, a baby, and God, just be with them all. Thank you for your gifts and your, your gracious love that you shared with us and the way that you blessed us yesterday with all these kids that were gathered to hear the good news and to, to celebrate your son's resurrection. God, pray for us as we, as we serve these children, as we minister to them at our schools and in our Sunday school and at Good News Club, God. I pray that you would raise up other laborers to come alongside and, and help us to, to share the good news of the gospel with this next generation that, that will lead our churches and they will carry the torch of the faith forward. God, I pray that you would bless our time together on this Palm Sunday. May your name be lifted high. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our offertory hymn is There is a Family, page 142 in the Red Hymnal. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand.
Father, we pray a prayer of forgiveness for the times we separate ourselves. But Father, we know that Jesus always shows us the way back. And we thank you for that. And Father, we thank you for the great faith that Cedar Rock shows as we meet. And we could be doing many other things. <clears throat> Father, we lift up those on the prayer list. Uh, Glenda Spring, with the baby that's premature. We pray that you uh, heal with comfort. And just, we know how sacred life is. Father, we ask you to bless this offering. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. We've been kind of bouncing around the Psalms the last couple of weeks. We have been looking at Easter through the lens of the Psalms. Kind of give you a road map where we're going. Uh, after Easter, we're going to begin a new series in the book of Galatians. So if you want to go ahead and start reading ahead, you can do that. Today we're going to be in Psalm chapter 2. As you're turning there, I'm going to begin our time in God's Word and prayer. Father God, thank you that Jesus went down the Via Dolorosa. He endured suffering. He was crucified. He was killed for us. <coughs> So we could have life. We could have forgiveness. Amen. God, may we never get over that. May we never get over the Easter story, the resurrection. And God, today as we look at King Jesus through the lens of Psalm chapter 2, God, I pray that you would magnify our view of who Jesus is and why he and he alone deserves our worship. Amen. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we no longer live in a, in a government where kings and queens rule. So we kind of throw around the word king and use it for, for much lesser things. For example, we say that somebody is the king of rock and roll. Who's that? Elvis. Elvis, right. <coughs> the king of NASCAR. Richard Petty. Richard Petty, that's right. 43. King of basketball. Man. Oh, we've got a lot of options there, right? Today, you probably say King James, LeBron James, right? There would be some who would disagree with that. I don't know about that. Well, we'll have to argue with that. But right now, we'll say LeBron James. What about the King of Queens? Remember that show? I don't know. Doug okay. Heffernan. Doug Heffernan. You've got it. He knows his sitcoms. Thank you. So we've got a lot of kings nowadays, right? Maybe lesser kings. And Jesus calls himself a king too. Or we call him a king. Scriptures call him a king. So the question is, is he a king like that? Mm -hmm. What kind of king is he? Mm -hmm. That's the question we're going to look at when we look at Psalm chapter 2. Today is Palm Sunday. And, and on Palm Sunday, we remember the day that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. The people worshipped him as a king. But just a couple days later, they killed him. They betrayed him, they tried him, and they killed him. And the irony about Palm Sunday was Jesus actually is a king. He just wasn't the king they were expecting, nor is he often the king that we are expecting. Again, the question, what kind of king is Jesus? Psalm 2 paints a picture of the king that we worship. Follow in your own Bibles as I read aloud. Verse 1, why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. And kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, 
I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. <clears throat> Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We're not sure when this particular psalm was written. We're not really sure who wrote it. But we do know that this psalm was read whenever a new king was crowned in Israel. And it was read with an expectant hope that though there was a king then, that a better king was coming. But before it tells us about our king, it tells us about a rebellion. Again, in verses 1 through 3, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The picture the author of this psalm here, or the psalmist, the picture he's painting for us is like an ancient version of a group of powerful world leaders and dignitaries sitting around in a smoky room. They're scheming. They're planning. Because they want to overthrow God. Amen. They want to overthrow his anointed one or the king. They say, verse 3, let us burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us. In other words, God has offered them his benevolent love and care and rule, and they violently throw it off. They trample it to the ground. They want no part in God's rule. They want to rule themselves. They're staging a rebellion, and God's response to the rebellions in verse 4. He says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have sent my king of Zion, my holy hill. Yeah. God sees the rebellions yeah. and he laughs. Amen. It's funny to him. The idea that these puny human kings and rulers could overthrow him, it's outlandish. It's like if I were in a competition with Bob Gardner over who could farm the best, okay? Bob Gardner's crops would beat me tenfold, right? He knows what he's doing. Or if I were in a competition, a target shooting competition with Gene, right? Gene is going to wipe the floor with me. Or if I were in a singing competition with Dana, or any member of the choir, or the, the whole Dufton crew, right? They would just completely demolish me. That's what this scenario is like. Mm -hmm. God looks at these rulers and says, seriously, guys? Yeah. You want to overthrow me? I created you. I created everything, and I want you to know I have my own king. Mm -hmm. The world is staging rebellion against God. All the great world powers and bright minds and military minds gather to overthrow God. They boast against God. God's response is to laugh. For he is all-powerful, they are but. Church, we need to hear God's word on this point. Because every day we are confronted with news headlines and feature stories that show us some of the world's schemes against God. Amen. These things paint a picture of people who boast against God. For example, we can look abroad and see boasts against God. If you were to read the headlines the last couple of years, you would see Christians being beheaded by ISIS. Yeah. Or brave believers being trampled under tanks in North Korea. Or just this week, a North Carolina pastor being imprisoned for life in Turkey for quote-unquote terrorism charges, really just sharing the gospel. Hmm. These are real stories of Christians just like you and me. The world still boasts against God. Or we can look around our own country, our own culture, and see boast against God. We see some leaders who deny the unborn the dignity of life when God says, I know them in the womb. Amen. 
We see other leaders embroiled in scandal for gross, ungodly sexual misconduct. Our country, our leaders from both sides of the aisle, from every part of the country, we boast against God. And we see these boasts against God, these rebellions, and it's easy to get fearful. We see what's happening. We imagine God is powerless to do anything about it. So we turn to anyone who promises to deliver us from it. Or we retreat from the world. Or we give in because it's just easier that way. But listen, when God looks at the rebellions, he's not afraid. Amen. When God sees the schemes, he's not cowering in the shadows. He's, he's not hoping that we're just going to find the right person or have the right policy or send the right army. No, God laughs at the rebellions. He snickers at the schemes. Because God is all powerful, all just, all wise, and righteous, and He will have the last word. So when we see depressing headlines or burdensome boasts against God, we of all people should be the least fearful, Amen. the most joyful. Because the God we worship is not weak. Our God reigns, yep. and He will reign for all time. The second reason we need to hear God at this point. Because the rebellion we're talking about is not just out there, the rebellion is in here. Years ago, a newspaper posed the question uh, What's wrong with the world? Think about it. How would you answer that question? What's wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton, a brilliant Christian thinker from about a century ago, Reportedly wrote a brief letter to answer that question, what's wrong with the world? This is what he said. Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world, G.K. says? It's me. So often we have this notion the bad guys are out there. We slap a label on them that makes them seem worse, makes us seem better. These kinds of rebellions we see in the scriptures don't just exist out there, they exist in each and every one of our hearts. Amen. Every whiff of pride is a boast against God. Every lustful thought boast against God. <clears throat> Every profane word boasts against God. Every word of gossip or trace of racism or ounce of idolatry boasts against God. We need to realize that we are just like the nations, the rulers, the kings in these verses. On our own, we are those who are staging the rebellion. On our own, it is our attempts to throw off God's rule that God finds ridiculous. So ask yourself, don't worry about the world. How are you rebelling against Almighty God? Not, not how's your neighbor doing it, not how are those people doing it. How are you rebelling against God? Because of all such rebellion out there and in here is foolish. The psalmist explains why in the next section where he promises the king, verse 7. He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. He says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Does that sound familiar to you at all? This little verse, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, is referenced everywhere in the New Testament. Most clear example, you think of John 3.16. Jesus is talking to, to, to Nicodemus, and he says, um, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Who is he talking about? Jesus. Himself. At Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist immerses Jesus in the water, and, and, and people audibly hear God the Father say, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Later, Jesus and then three of his buddies, Peter, James, and John, are going up on a mountain. All of a sudden, Jesus lights up like a Christmas tree. They're wondering what's going on, and they hear God say, This is my 
son, with whom I well please listen to him. Later, after the church's birth, Paul and Barnabas, these missionaries, are going out and they're speaking to a crowd of Jewish people in Acts. They talk about how Jesus rose from the grave and, and they quote this verse to say, this, this is the guy. Later, the author of Hebrews twice quotes this verse in connection with Jesus. So the New Testament writers all looked back to Psalm 2, which was written a thousand years before, and they said, this is pointing to the Christ. So the psalmist is telling us in this verse, you know, the world may boast against God. We may boast against God, but a king is coming. He is God's begotten son, and he's going to take care of business. And now on the other side of the cross, we know exactly who that king is, don't we? It is King Jesus. The psalmist continues, verse 8, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. God tells the king, look, your reign will extend to the ends of the earth. This means that Jesus is not just king of the Jews, he is king of all people. He is not just the king of Israel, he is the king of all lands. He's not just the king inside the four walls of this church building, he's a king in all places. He's not just a king on Sunday, he's a king for all time. God says, I will give my son, the king, all the nations. And what's he going to do, verse 9? You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces. Like a potter's vessel. <coughs> Other parts of scripture, God, God tells us how Jesus is the hope for the nations. Right? He is the hope for those who, who trust in Christ. He will be their savior. But this verse shows us the flip side of that. For those who do not trust Christ, for those who, who do not have that hope, he will be their judge. He will squash the rebellion. Psalmist says, a king is coming. He's going to take care of this. Maybe you're wondering, Nathaniel, it's Palm Sunday. What does any of this have to do with Easter? The truth is, it has everything to do with Easter. Because this begotten son came to the earth a thousand years later as that humble servant. He taught he healed. He performed miracles. He, he walked on water. He caused storms to stop. He was lauded as a king on Palm Sunday, but only as the king people wished he'd be, not the king he really was. Because then this holy, righteous, humble king died. He died on the cross, not because he did anything wrong, but because we did. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. The beautiful thing about Easter is that he did not stay dead. On that Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away and he wasn't there. The tomb was empty. Jesus had risen from the grave victoriously. And at that moment, the king began to institute his new kingdom. Yeah. And now he does so in small, subtle ways. He takes people like you and me, sinners who deserve judgment. And we turn from our sins and we trust in him and we bring pockets of hope to a dark and dying world. Amen. And then one day he promises the king is coming back. He's going to bring his kingdom in full where our resurrected king Jesus will rule on his throne and will rule all the nations. So the promise of Easter is not just a promise of, of eggs or bunnies or spring or flowers. The promise of Easter is of a resurrected king who's coming back. And this king looks at our world, he doesn't quiver at the rebellions, he's not afraid because he's already conquered the worst thing that could happen, he's conquered death. Amen. King Jesus is not afraid, King Jesus reigns and he will reign for all time. So there's this rebellion, God promises the king, what should our response be to this king? The next section addresses that question, verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The psalmist here gives a series of pointed comments to those of us who would stage rebellions against God. He says, be wise. Because obviously, staging rebellions against God is not wise. 
<laughs> he says, be warned. So it doesn't end well for those who rebel against God. He says, serve the Lord with fear, not because you're scared, but because he deserves awe and reverence and honor. He says, rejoice with trembling. In other words, praise God with every ounce of your being. Amen. And he says, kiss the Son. Like, honor him as the king that he is. He concludes with a promise. He says, all who do this, who take refuge in God instead of running away from God, they will be blessed. So God's telling us in these verses, don't mess around with the rebellion. Don't throw off God's good rule and God's command. Gladly submit your life to this king. Submit your life. And this idea of submitting your life something seems strange. You say, you know, why, why should I submit my life to, to Jesus or anyone? I'm my own man. Or I'm my own woman. Or we think, you know, why would God even demand that we give our lives to Him? Isn't that kind of mean? But the truth is that, you know, we think we are free. We think we are our own man or woman. But, but all of us are actually submitting our lives to something else. All of us are giving our allegiance to someone or something. Maybe your allegiance is to another religion, like an Islam or a Buddhism or one of Christianity's cheap substitutes. Or maybe you give your allegiance to your work, right? Everything you do revolves around how it affects your career. Maybe you give your allegiance to your children, your grandchildren. Right? They are the most important thing in it. That you just kind of put them on this pedestal that they can't really, uh, you know, they're going to let you down one day. <coughs> Maybe you give your allegiance to a sports team. The game's on, you're nowhere else other than that recliner, right? You're going to watch the game. Maybe you give your allegiance to a politician or a political party, right? Whatever your team says or does, you, you just defend it no matter what scripture says. Maybe you give your allegiance to a hobby or a habit, this good thing that you have been exalted to an unhealthy position. Maybe you give your allegiance to an addiction, something that sucks the life and vitality out of your soul and you're too blind to see it. Or maybe, maybe you just give your allegiance to yourself. Your life's about you, you alone, that's it. The point is, all of us are giving our allegiance to something. Something is sitting on the throne of our lives, and we do what we do to please that thing. It's not a question of whether we are doing this, but what is that thing? So ask yourself, what is that thing that is, that is you're submitting your life to, that is sitting on the throne of your life? Because the problem with these other allegiances, these things that put on the thrones of our lives, they don't satisfy. They don't fulfill they always, always, always let us down because they're not all good, because they're not all powerful. They cannot sustain the weight of our worship. Then we have Jesus. Jesus demands our allegiance. He demands we submit our life to him because he's the only one who really deserves it. Amen. He is all good. There's not an ounce of wickedness or an imperfection or anything in him. He is all powerful. He ruled the world before it was made. He rules it now. He's going to rule it for all eternity after all of our little idols and things have crumbled and fallen to the ground. Amen. In a world of people parading themselves as their own kings and their own rulers, he's the only one who actually is king. He will rule with justice and righteousness for all eternity. I think of it like this. Imagine that you were going to play pickup basketball. Okay? You go to some court somewhere and there's a bunch of People standing around, and you get to pick which team you're going to be on. Right? You could join your friend Phil's team. And Phil is really good at basketball, but only on his Xbox. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you could join his team if you wanted to. Or you could join your cousin Susie's team. Susie, Susie's real nice. She, she's real sweet, but she's never actually played basketball. No, but you could join her team. Or you could go join Uncle Chester's team. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uncle Chester is only 5'7". Um, he eats a couple too many potato chips in a given day, but you could join his team. 
you got Phil, Susie, Chester, and then you got LeBron James. All right? You could join LeBron James' team. Who are you going to pick? It's a no-brainer, right? If you have any common sense, you're going to pick LeBron James' team. In the same way, we have these options of things we pick to give our allegiances to in our lives. Um, our work, our, our family, our addiction, whatever it is, these things that we can pick. And only Jesus' team is going to last. Mm -hmm. It's a no-brainer. Don't you want to be on his team? Amen. Don't you want to be on the team that's actually going to win? Don't you want to worship the real king who will always satisfy and to be honest, following Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't always easy. I mean, if you get on LeBron James' team, he's, he's going to coach you up, and it's going to be painful for a while. And giving your allegiance to Jesus means you are ripping it away from something else, and that it's going to be hard to do. Yeah. But, but following King Jesus, living his way, is always, always worth it. Mm. This morning, <coughs> this Palm Sunday, Whose team are you on? You play for Uncle Chester because he gives you potato chips? Are you playing for LeBron James because he's going to win? Are you a member of the rebellion? Pledging your life to false gods? Living your life as a boast against God? Or are you a member of the kingdom? Living your life in submission to the one true king? Amen. Truth is all of us default into the rebellion. Yeah. All of us deserve the death and the judgment for our betrayal but this same King Jesus who deserves our worship, who deserves to condemn us, who will one day crush the wicked, this same King Jesus made a way for us to change teams. That's the story of Easter. He lived the life we couldn't. He died the death we deserved on that cool Sunday morning he rose from the grave. Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can switch teams. And this morning, on the cusp of Easter, you have an opportunity to leave the rebellion, to pledge allegiance to the king, and to run to his good and loving, warm embrace. Amen. Which team do you want? Father God, search our hearts. Help us to evaluate our own lives honestly. And right now, show us what is on the throne in our lives. God, if there's anything other than your Son on the throne of our lives, may we repent. May we tell you we're sorry. And we kick that thing off the front of our lives and put your son there instead. Uh, if there's anyone here who has never done that before, who is living their life for something that won't satisfy them, may you convict them and burden them to the degree that they turn their life from that thing and turn it towards you. And may you give them the courage to profess that to others. To say, I don't want to live for this anymore. I want to live for Jesus. And God, when we have our time of invitation, give them the courage to make the bold step to say, I don't want that anymore. I want to follow you. God, for those of us who are Christians, who do claim your name, we are so tempted to let other things creep up onto the throne of our lives with you. Convict us of those things and help us to live for your glory and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would stand, we're going to sing him of invitation 315, room at the cross. And the truth is there is room at the cross for you. If God has convicted you, come for me and pray to Jesus. Please stay.
bedroom at the cross.